Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com. In this study, we took time to look at the biblical answer to the question of why Jesus had to die. What does Jesus' death have to do with you? Why the death of a man, and how does that save me? We've titled this message, Why Did Jesus Have to Die? And we pray that it answers questions for skeptics and also helps the believer think these things through and be prepared to answer the lost man or woman who asks such questions. Get ready to let your fingers do the walking because we're going to move around a little bit tonight. We're going to answer a question, why did Jesus have to die? You say, oh, I already know the answer to that, so I need to leave. Just uh, sit still. You need to understand this well enough to explain this. I, I always repeat that over and over. If you hear something taught here that you already maybe know, the question isn't, do you have head knowledge about it? The question is, do you know it well enough to share it with others? Um, I had somebody ask me this question and tell me they'd asked three other Christians previously and those three Christians could not answer this question. What about you? Someone walks up and says, I don't, I don't get it. Why did, what does Jesus dying on the cross got to do with me? How would you answer that? I'll give you a second. I just want you to think about it. I don't want out loud answers. I just want you to think about it. How would you answer that? By the way, some Christians, and I'm not saying this about Johnny, although he's offered himself up as a sacrificial <laughs> lamb, uh, some Christians would say they know the answer to that, and when you hear their answer, they don't know the answer. So the question tonight is, I want you to answer right now, how would you answer that? And then, as we discuss it tonight, test yourself. How well would you have done on, on, the, on the spot? Because if you're living the Christian life, and you're preaching the gospel, your day's coming. The only reason you don't have to answer these questions that we deal with is because you're not doing the work. Shame on you then. Amen? Amen. Come on, man. I shouldn't have to pull that out. Yeah, you just uh, offer that up. <laughs> Revelation 15, look at verse 4. Read that with me. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. That's just one of many, many verses of Scripture that tell us that we have not only a one true God, there's only one God. Allah's not it. None of the other false religions and their gods are the God. There's only one true God. And there's something about that, though, that there's a lot of people who would admit that they believe in, a, in one God. And they'll even say, oh yeah, you know, I believe in God, the God of the Bible. But have you noticed today's God isn't holy? Yep. Have you noticed that? And if they don't outright deny His holiness, they never mention it. Folks, that's why there's a dearth. Number one, if people believe in Darwinian evolution, then you've got a strike against you right there. Because if you believe in Darwinian evolution, there's no God. So talking to somebody about God and the Bible and the Gospel is like beating your head against the wall because they don't even believe they exist. But then you take somebody who says, I'm a theist, I believe in God, but they've got this idea of God that is Joel Osteen's God and not the God of the Bible, that is the prosperity gospel God and not the God of the Bible, is the Freemason God and not the God of the Bible. Name your God. There's a God, but He's not holy. Then that person will not get saved. No. Yep. Write that down. Amen. If you've got a loved one who doesn't believe that God is holy, they will not get saved. Ever. Not until they embrace that truth. Because then when you embrace the truth that God is holy, then you embrace this whole truth of fearing God, which, again, today's God isn't feared. And they will even tell you, a perfect love casteth out fear. Yes, uh, fearing being cast into hell is gone once you're saved. Amen. 
But you still fear Him in the sense of knowing that He is holy. He will not put up with sin. And even though He may not cast you into hell for sinning, He will chastise you. And if He has to, look at me, He'll kill you. Amen. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God people don't like. That's the God they don't want to hear about. My God wouldn't do something like that. you got a fake God. My God's not like that. Well, you worship the devil. Yes, sir. Your God is a small g. Mine's a big g. Amen? Amen? Look at that again before we move on. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? There's only one name. It's not Allah. It's not... Uh, well, the, some of these religions don't even have a God. Do you understand that? Like the Buddha, uh, the Hindus, they don't really even have a God. They have a plethora of deities they worship, but no, there's no one single God. Uh, but he, he, he's got a name, and today you reach God the Father through the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. It's at the name of Jesus that it says, there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12. Yes. You don't believe that, you're going to go to hell. Amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. Now it goes, it says, Thou only art holy. No one but God in heaven is holy. No other human being who's ever walked this planet is holy but Jesus. And yes, I'm saying that Jesus is God. And we'll come back to that in a minute. It goes on to say, For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. We're going to move kind of quick tonight, but in answer to this question, why did Jesus have to die? You need to understand it. It's about Jesus. It's not about church. It's not about programs. It's not about healing. It's not about any of these things that a lot of churches, denominations, and TV ministries and everything make it about. It's about Jesus. Who is Jesus? And do I have to believe on Him and His death, burial, and resurrection in order to be saved? That's the question. And uh, Romans 3.23 says something that some of you are going to recognize that verse, but I want you to turn there anyway. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. And you've got a holy God, and we've established that for anybody who believes the Bible, a holy God, but then you've got to look in the mirror. In Romans 3.23, read that with me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I have sinned. You have sinned. Every pope that's ever existed has sinned. Buddha sinned. Muhammad sinned. Confucius sinned. Satan sinned. Adam and Eve sinned. That is the key because every one of their offspring, right down to you and me, have been born with sin. You came out of the womb in sin. And then when you became aware and conscious, the first thing you did was sin. And we've talked about this before, but for the, for the sake of a few of you who wasn't here and we talked about it, uh, when a baby cries, at first, it's legit. Hungry mama. Feed me mama. Change me mama. Dirty diaper mama. Wah, all this. It, it, that's for real. But then all of a sudden, they, something clicks and they think, now wait a minute. Now all I got to do is wah, and they come a running. <laughs> now I'm not really hungry, and my diaper's not really dirty, but I don't like being in here all by myself. <laughs> wah, and here comes mama running. They're already a deceiver. That little cute little cuddly thing is a liar. <laughs> and it just gets worse, don't it? Amen. The older they get, the deeper it gets. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's your dilemma. You've got a holy God, and then you are a sinner. And when you look in the mirror, you're looking at a sinner. And that puts a gulf between you and God. The, uh, 
the, the statement that you hear people say all the time is you can't get a person saved until you get them lost. And that's the truth. I want you to look over in Psalm uh, uh, 8. Psalm 8. Psalm 8. Or as Ed likes to say, Psalm chapter 8. Yeah. <laughs> Psalm 8. And this is a great one to mark in your Bible. Great one to memorize. But a lot of people have memorized it for the sake of, and I'm not saying anything wrong with this, but they memorize it for the sake of the creation debate and that sort of thing. But the, I've, I've noticed that some of those folks miss the, the, some of the message that's here. In Psalm 8, and verse 3 and 4, read that with me. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? And you can go on, but the point there is simple. God is so awesome, and he is so powerful, and he is so holy. And then when you look in the mirror, you see that. You ought to be asking this question, really, especially before you're saved. A non-Christian should look at creation. Romans 1 says that the creation itself bears witness and is a witness that there is a Creator. And folks, I'm telling you, you go dive into that deep stuff from the Carl Sagan's and the Stephen J. Gould's and the guys who wrote all this stuff, and even the Dawkins and the lesser minds among that group. You read their stuff and they will constantly come out and admit that it does appear that there's an intelligence behind this. It does appear that creation had to have a designer and a creator. It appears that way. And then they go on to say, but it's just an appearance. It's not reality. They're coming a day when they're going to stand before God. And those words are going to be read back to them. And they are going to do nothing but stand there and stare if they're not flat on their face. Because those words are true words and they are going to answer for the fact they knew. They saw. They looked around and they said exactly what we... They had to have had this thought. Every one of them had this thought. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? Now think about that. God visits man? Yes. In the person of Jesus Christ. You see, when you sinned, you sinned against an infinite, in a, infinite God. The, the God of creation who knows no beginning and no ending, no limit to His power or knowledge, perfect in all ways, completely holy, infinite. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but that's beyond understanding. It's beyond comprehension. That's your God. And when you sin, you didn't sin against yourself, even though this sin may affect you. And you, you may have sinned against some other human being and affected them, but you didn't just sin against them. You sinned against God, the infinite Creator. Look over at Isaiah 53, which of course the, the whole chapter, Isaiah 53, is, uh, is something that you ought to read, be familiar with, even put to memory if you have a memory capable of doing that. Isaiah 53, it uh, begins, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And it goes on to basically describe the rejection of Jesus Christ by Israel and His crucifixion. And it says in verse 4, Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sor sorrows. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Look who the thumb, the fingers pointing at who? Us. Us. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him and with His stripes we are healed. <clears throat> Romans 8 explains that full, complete healing is going to happen when we are glorified and we get our redeemed body. And then verse 6, read that. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We have to let that uh, register and sink in. 
This is a prophecy of Jesus who came and died on the cross and all of our iniquity was poured on Jesus. Folks, meditate on that sometime. Without Jesus Christ, you and I have absolutely no hope. Amen. Without Jesus Christ, you have nothing to look forward to. You have nothing but... If there is a God, you have nothing but damnation to look forward to. If there weren't a God, which is insane to think about, if you think about it, <laughs> but if there weren't a God, we had nothing. We're just on this ship till it crashes. <laughs> There's no hope. It's only because of Jesus Christ that we have hope. So the question is, why did Jesus have to come and die for us? Well, we let that reality set in of the holiness of God and the sinfulness, not just of man, but of me. My sinfulness. And the fact that when I sin, I sin against God. And once you let that sink in, then you start to understand the reason why Jesus had to come. Look at uh, Genesis 39.9. I just uh, remembered I wanted to turn there a moment ago and I forgot. 39.9. Genesis 39.9. And this is uh, the story of uh, Joseph. And right in the middle of it is a... Is a incredible truth that again most people aren't getting today when they think about God and sin and look at verse 9 Genesis 39 verse 9 it says there is none greater in this house than I talking about Potiphar's house neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee because thou art his wife Potiphar's wife was wanting Joseph to uh, commit adultery with her uh, he she was trying to pull Joseph into an affair, as they call it uh, in today's vernacular. And it says, How then can I do this great wickedness, and look at those last three words, four words, and sin against God? Look close at that. Joseph, having sex with Potiphar's wife, was a sin against God if he had done it. Newsflash, that's true about all sin. Amen. All sin is against God. When it says all have sinned, all have sinned against God. And the payment has to match the, pen, the, the actual crime. It, how many of you have heard him say, uh, eye for an eye, and the whole world goes blind? You heard that? He's, the, he's probably the originator. Because now it's all chanted even at rallies and things against the death penalty and that sort of thing. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, that, those are the words of God. And the idea that the world, uh, they take that and twist that because they don't have any concept of holiness. Yeah. and righteousness. And the reason God said that was, it was it's like this. If, if I you know, threw my Bible across the room and knocked Ed's eye out, then God said, now, you're going to either take an eye out from Greg, which I'd give you this one, it wouldn't matter, and either that or you have to pay a certain amount of fine that is equal to the loss of an eye. You couldn't take me out and behead me. You see what I'm saying? It was justice. It was equality in law. Equity in law. And so an eye for an eye was whatever... God was setting the standard so that we would understand this. That when you commit a crime, you commit a sin, there's payback. And that payback has to equal the crime of the sin. Well, when it's against Charlie or against John or against Jim then I've sinned against you, you're an equal to me, so let's see, what did I do? Oh, I backed into your car and knocked your headlight out. Okay, well, I'll pay to have that replaced. And then I call my insurance company. That's the way it works. With God, you have committed a sin, 
against an infinite God, that sin, every one of them, requires an infinite payment. That's something, folks, that you can't do. That's why we say works cannot save you. Why? Because it's impossible. It's statistically, mathematically impossible for you to do any work or number of works that will equal infinity to pay for even the first sin you've ever committed. And even if you could do that, you still have the stain of original sin on you in your flesh. There's no way you can save yourself. There's no way a sinner like Muhammad or a sinner like Buddha could have saved me. I had to have a Savior who could save me. And the only Savior that could do that is God, who came in the person of Jesus Christ in order that He could pay for your sin. Look over at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. In Hebrews 10.4, Hebrews, the whole book, Paul is explaining to these Jews, these Hebrews, who are still offering sacrifice in the temple, uh, even though they claim to believe in Jesus. And he's explaining to them that you can't have it that way. It, can't, there, it, can't wor it doesn't work. It won't work. It does no good. It's blasphemous. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, read that with me. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. You and I have a problem. The Bible says that the life is in the blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. You've got to have blood, and it's got to be death because the wages of sin is death. So how does this work? It can't work. There's no way, no animal, no number of animals, all those animals that were killed under the Old Testament didn't pay for sin. They can't. They were a picture of something to come that would pay for sin. But they couldn't pay for sin. And no other human being could die. I can't die for my own sins, let alone die for yours. There's no human being who ever lived that qualified to die and pay for sin. Angels, sorry Jehovah's Witnesses, but angels can't die for sins. If Jesus is just Michael the Archangel, we're lost. Because if Michael the Archangel died for sins, we're still in our sins. An angel can't die for sins. A finite God of some sort. The Mormons have a finite God. Their God Elohim was once a man who became a God. He's finite. And He sent His Son, who's finite, Jesus, to die on the cross to clean our slate so we could work our way to heaven. That's Mormonism. No. doesn't work. Blood is required, but there was only one way that blood could pay for sins, and that is if it involved the death of an infinite <coughs> sacrifice. Folks, that's why these cults and false religions are so dangerous. If you don't understand that they are preaching a dangerous, counterfeit message that cannot save anybody, then you'll have the attitude that a lot of other people have. A lot of other people have the attitude, well, as long as they're sincere, that sincerity has nothing to do with it. You can be so sincere that you'd blow yourself up. That isn't going to help. Sincerity doesn't help anything. You have to be obedient to the truth. And over in uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, if you turn there, turn back to 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. If you're not reading a King James Bible you will not see what we're going to see right now. The new versions, the NIV, New American Standard, English Standard, and all those have corrupted this verse. Read that with me. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, 
justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That's a, a, a presentation of the Gospel. That Jesus came and He was God manifest in the flesh. He was the infinite God. Keep your finger there and turn over to John chapter 1. And that is why this truth is so important. People, people say, well, the virgin birth really isn't important. Yes, it is. If He wasn't born of a virgin, He was a sinner like you and I and could not die for our sins. Amen. They say, well, the miracles aren't important. Yes, He had to demonstrate His deity or He had no claims to deity. Well, the genealogies aren't important. Yes, they are. He had to not only be born of a virgin, but that virgin had to be of the, uh, the kingly stock of David. And then his father, for legal reasons, also had to be of that kingly stock of David. And that's what you get. Matthew 1 shows Joseph descended from David through Solomon. Luke, I believe it's chapter 3, gives you the genealogy of Mary and how that she descended from David through Nathan, his son Nathan. And the reason that is important is because back in the Old Testament, God had said that He will not raise up a king after the line of Jeconiah. Well, Jeconiah was in Joseph's line, so he couldn't be physically of the seed of Jeconiah. So that's why it worked out the way it did with Mary's gene genealogy going through Nathan. I mean, the, the more you dig and the more you see this, it's intricate and it's, it's got the fingerprints of God all over it. And it was God who came in the person of Jesus Christ to die because He had to or we were damned. Amen. John chapter 1, read that first verse. In the beginning was the Word. Capital W. Let me tell you something. Don't use a capital W when you're talking about the book because God never did. When you're talking about the book, it's small w. When you use a big W, you're talking about the living Christ, God manifest in the flesh. And that's why it's like that here. Go ahead and read it again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What? What's that mean? Verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. What, what do you mean? Well, verse 3, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Read verse 4. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 5. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That's telling you that the Creator God, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created. That's Jesus creating in Genesis 1.1. Jesus is the Creator God who came as a human being so that He could put on this uniform we wear and be a man and die on the cross to pay for the sins of man. Infinite God on a cross, dying as a man to pay for the sins of the whole world. And without that, you're lost. You have no hope. But with that, you have life. And the Bible says... Oh, turn over. You look at this. John chapter 3. Just a couple pages. John chapter 3. Of course we know John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But look at verse 19, and read that with me. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. They tell you, people will look at you and say, I just don't believe that. Well, I just can't believe that. I just can't, it, it's just something I, I don't buy. You know why? Because their deeds are evil. They love their sin. And that goes for anybody in my family, your family. You know, we all, people get so emotional when it's a blood relative that we're talking about. Any human being who looks you in the eye after hearing the gospel and says, I don't believe it, I just can't believe it. You know why they don't believe it? They love their sin. Amen.